Base Nation, how U.S. military bases abroad harm America and the world. I'm Micah Dickenley, and this is Bookmarks. Welcome to Bookmarks. I'm your host, Mike Adekunle. The US military maintains over 800 facilities around the world. They play a large role in US foreign policy, some say too large. The question is the subject of the new book, Base Nation, How US Military Bases Abroad Harm American and the World, by David Vine, who joins us today. Dr. Vine is Associate Professor of Anthropology at American University. He is the author of The Island of Shame, The Secret History of the U.S. Military Base on Diego Garcia. His writing has appeared in The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Guardian, Mother Jones, The Boston Globe, The Huffington Post, and The Chronicle of Higher Education, among others. And joining us to critique the book is Peter Husey, president of Geostrategic Analysis, a national security policy firm he founded in 1981. He's a guest lecturer at the US Naval Academy on nuclear deterrent strategy, a columnist for Gatestone Institute, Family Security Matters, and Frontiers of Freedom, and a senior defense consultant with the Michelle Institute of Aerospace Studies at Air Force Association. He was previously a senior consultant to the National Defense University Foundation for 20 years. Dr. Husey also serves on publicsquare.net's advisory council. The views expressed are his own and not those of any affiliated institution or organization. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us. So Professor Vine, could you give us in a nutshell the main thesis of your book? If you, if you may, um, I would just say a quick word about how I came to the issue of US military bases overseas, because I think it's an issue which many Americans don't give a lot of thought to. I certainly didn't until 14 years ago, I got a phone call from some lawyers representing the exiled people of the Indian Ocean Island, Diego Garcia. This is an island where the US has a major military base. And the lawyers were calling because they asked me to do some research on behalf of the, the people to examine uh, the, the lives of the people who once lived on Diego Garcia and were forcibly removed from the island uh, to create the base in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And the people have been living in exile ever since. And this research, which I then came to undertake, really opened my eyes to the massive network of military bases that the United States maintains overseas. Uh, and led me to ask a number of questions. First of all, in the case of Diego Garcia, why did US government officials exile an entire people? Uh, why does the United States have a military base in the middle of the Indian Ocean in the first place? So we need a military base in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, and it le led me to le ask similar questions about this whole uh, collection of bases overseas, which now number around 800, 800 US military bases outside the 50 states in Washington, DC. And over the past 14 years, I've been carrying out this research, the past six years in particular on this book, Base Nation. And I found that on the whole, these bases do, as the subtitle suggests, harm America, harm Americans, harm people around the world in a variety of ways, beginning with the economic costs of these bases, which by my estimate, uh, we spend somewhere around $85 billion a year maintaining bases and troops overseas. Uh, could be as much as $160 billion if you count the cost of bases and troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, but in a range of other ways, these bases harm uh, Americans. Um, first of all, US military personnel and their families, uh, and harm people who live in communities around these bases in a variety of ways. Uh, the bases 
have tended to, sadly, prop up dictators and repressive regimes. They've caused environmental damage. They've led to crimes and uh, displacement like that, that faced by the people of Diego Garcia. Uh, they have, in a variety of ways, actually made war more likely. Contrary to the claim that these bases are needed to defend the United States, in fact, I think they're undermining US security in a variety of ways and actually making war easier to wage, uh, making interventionist wars and the disasters that have followed in cases like Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq more likely. And as a result, undermining the security of the United States, of people in the United States, and people around the world. And uh, Peter Husey, what do you think about the book? Well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Michael, and thank you, David, for putting this book together. I know what a labor of love it is to do a 50-page paper for my clients. This is a book is a different story. Uh, I took a look at the book, and a thing that struck me is the lack of any strategy to determine where we should close a base, where should we open a base, where should we keep a base expanded or reduce it. That was the biggest issue. The second issue is that if you don't have bases overseas, it costs you more money to do what you want to do if you do it all from America. Third is that in the world we live in, speed is an extraordinarily important thing. And then when you look at not only is it going to cost more if we do it from America, we're not going to be able to do what we want to do. We do, we're the largest humanitarian organization in the world. We are dependent on airlift and tankers to fuel and bring stuff. And we don't have enough tankers and we don't have enough airlift to get to the places in the world you want to because it's the other guy is going to determine if war breaks out, unfortunately. The second part is that the book says that the threats against us are declining when the threat assessments from the National Intelligence Officer, General Clapper, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff just appointed, and the vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff just appointed, both in testimony before the Hill said they have never seen the world more seriously a threat to the United States than except for at the height of the Cold War. And they particularly mention Russia and China and Iran and North Korea, all of which have problems. Let me give you some examples. 90% of the oil goes through the Straits of Hormuz, which Iran has the capability to dramatically disrupt. The Red Sea, which is where Yemen is, because you don't go to Yemen because you want to build a villa to have a vacation. But the reason people are fooling around with Yemen is it's the gateway to the Red Sea, and that is Europe's connection to all of Asia and the Middle East, both oil and trade. And then you have the Straits of Malacca, which are 90% of all the world trade goes through those straits. Take the Somalian pirates, for example. When the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was asked a number of years ago, how did the pirates know to grab the SS Sirius Star, the largest crude carrier in the world, 400 kilometers off the coast of Somalia? The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said there are only two countries that could have helped them, the United States and Russia with GPS, and it wasn't us. And there was no follow-up to the question. The thing is, we later found out, yes, indeed, the Russians helped them grab the SS Sirius Star because they were upset with the Saudis for pumping too much oil. Putin wanted oil production to go down so the price will go up. I've written about this for Gatestone, and in that essay I point out that's where oil got to $147 a barrel, directly because the Somalian pirates were given aid by Russia. That, of course, caused the crash of our economy, because it was a twin oil bubble that, coupled with the housing bubble, led to an, about $16 trillion in lost uh, GDP in the United States. And when you look at something like that, you begin to see the connection between our bases and keeping the world running according to the rules we adopted after World War II. The Iranians have an interesting phrase. They call us the great arrogance. They're very upset with the rules that have to do with banking, trade, diplomats. Remember, they grabbed our diplomats illegally in 1979. They have killed thousands of Americans in places where we were peacekeepers in Lebanon. That was endorsed by the UN, endorsed by the US Congress. Those bases, we didn't, we, our barracks were there and they were killed by the Iranians. 240 Marines were killed by Hezbollah, or a group that became Hezbollah, as you know. When I looked at the worldwide threat assessment by this administration, I looked at the countries they said were the top terror countries in the world and top terror countries that sponsor and hold terrorists. I'm going to read them to you. Iran, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon, Tunisia, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Somalia, North Korea. Not a single American base is in any of those countries. 
in particular, I look at Korea. The, the professor says that our bases tend to impoverish the country they're in. Take Korea and Egypt. In 1960, they had $150 per capita income. Their populations were within two million of each other. Uh, Korea had American bases, Egypt did not. Where are they today? Today, Egypt has a GDP per, per capita of $1,900. Korea now has 17,000. If anything, Egypt was impoverished by being a client state of the Soviets, and Korea was made prosperous by being a colleague and friend and a, of the United States. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guests through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on air towards the end of the show. So obviously, you think there's some good that's come out of the basis. What is your response? Lots to respond to. Um, I guess I would, I would first just just say on the, the last one of the last points that uh, the economic uh, impacts of bases are complicated, um, and I, I actually don't say that that bases impoverish countries. Uh, they've had complicated impacts, and in many cases, have enriched certain individuals, often elites um, and private corporations, both U.S. and and local. Um, but I, I think there are many ways in which. Peter and I agree uh, on a number of things. I think from some of your initial comments, it sounds like you agree that there are, in some cases, places where bases could be closed. And I, I see that as a good sign. And, and there are, I think, a growing bipartisan consensus that, that there are bases overseas that are simply unnecessary, that are extraordinarily costly. And, and that is, I guess, an, another point I would raise, that that um, bases, the RAND Corporation has shown this, uh, bases overseas are much more costly uh, on the whole uh, when they're maintained overseas as compared to a comparable base in the United States. Similarly, I'd point out that the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, and the RAND Corporation in separate research studies have shown that US troops can be deployed from the continental United States or in some cases Hawaii just as quickly to uh, zones overseas, generally speaking, as from bases overseas. Technological advancements have allowed the United States to deploy forces with remarkable speed. And the value of overseas bases has accordingly declined significantly. Let me, let me respond back, it's very important. The chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff study had to do with light forces, like special ops, had nothing to do with heavy forces which involve tanks and artillery. That you have to take either by sea, which takes a long time, or by outsized airlift, which is the sum of the C-17s can carry one tank or a C-5 that carries two. But that takes a lot of time. For example, in 1973, when our Navy ships arrived in Israel to resupply them, the war was over. The only way Israel got resupplied in the 73 war with the Arab world is by our C-5 airplanes, which was a close call whether or not we'd even have built them because we barely had enough. I wish I could agree with the RAND report, but it's wrong. You cannot do come to the defense of South Korea and Japan if North Korea invades from CONUS, the continental United States. Let me give you one final, give you a little story. When my former boss at the National Defense University and the Air Force Association, General Mike Dunn, interviewed the highest ranking defector in the history of North Korea to the south, he was Kim Jong-il's Tudor, he was the inventor of Jusei, which is their self-reliant uh, philosophy. He was asked by General Dunn, why is North Korea developing nuclear weapons? And the gentleman told him, the sole reason is that when you withdraw your forces from South Korea, North Korea will invade. And they will use the nuclear weapons as an umbrella under which to say to America and its allies, you can't come back and defend South Korea. I can't defend the airfields in South Korea once they're abandoned because the North Koreans are gonna lay down biological and chemicals in those areas and in Japan with their missiles. And there's no way you're gonna be able to get from CONUS to that part of the world because it's gonna take you a day and a half to two days just to get your forces ready. And when they get there, if you haven't operated with the country, if you haven't had interoperability and you know what our doctrine is and shared that kind of thing, you can't just walk in and say, okay, where do I land? because unless you've exercised together and you can't exercise the United States to defend the country, the continental, uh, the, the peninsula of Korea. Okay. So we, I think you both um, agree that the 
military is already reducing, is what you're saying, but those bases are necessary for logistic purposes Fair in order so. to help. I, I what do you say to that? Logistically, we need the bases. Do you agree or do you? I, I don't agree. Um, I, I think part of the problem is that this is a, an outdated military strategy. It's a military strategy born of World War II, a war that ended 70 years ago and of the Cold War. So and what about the specific example that he gave with Korea, for instance? How will we get there in time? Sadly, I think there's a lot of um, unnecessary fears that are trumped up about North Korea. North Korea is an impoverished nation. I think any attack on South Korea, which is one of the 10, 15 most wealthiest nations in the world, would be suicidal with the United States as an ally uh, and the United States maintaining unmatched uh, military forces, conventional and nuclear. Uh, any attack by, by North Korea of any significance would be, would be suicidal. Um, so I think it's, it's unlikely. And I, I think the United States has the military power to deploy from the United States. Um, does not need to be in places like Okinawa, where, where, where our presence has inflamed uh, so many locals and angered so many locals. Um, and I think, you know, frankly, the, the presence of U.S. bases in, in East Asia uh, is, generally speaking, increasing military tensions with China tensions. and North Korea. So I would what say about the, the I would say absolutely the opposite. When I visited South Korea as a student, I was one of the only four Americans ever to study in South Korea as a university student. And I went in 1969 and 70 with two, one young lady from Redwood College, another from University of uh, Michigan. And I went there with the same attitude as the professor did, is that American military forces were kind of bad for America. This was at the height of the Vietnam War. And in two years, I completely changed my mind because I went and worked with the bases and said, you've got to visit Yonsei University where I went to school. You've got to come and talk to the people in their homes and they got to come and see you. They already had Korean soldiers called Katusa, the Korean augmentation of the US Army that worked with our bases. But in Korea, for example, if you take a poll, about 85% of the people support the bases. Uh, the professor says in his book that we're an empire. It's on the last page of the a book where he says, uh, Britain got rid of its empire basically by being weak, and we either can get rid of it on purpose or we're going to be forced to. It's the only empire in history where we actually went to the countries and said, you get to vote on whether or not we're here. Every one of the countries that where we have major bases, uh, the country has voted to keep us there. And over and over again, they've had referendum that enabled us to stay there. I found in Korea that people loved Americans. And I find I was treated like royalty. And as far as the Koreans are, I work with them today to this day, uh, they're like brothers and sisters. And they have the same relationship with America. And when you look at the fact that that is one of the most prosperous countries in the world, starting from almost zero at the end of the Korean War, that country was destroyed. And yet, when you look at Egypt, North, South Korea has 12 times the per capita income and they started at exactly the same place in 1960. The 1960 figures I gave you is what I got off the internet today because I was going to go back to 53, which I did in a, in a previous study. But it's extraordinary what South Korea has achieved. And when you ask the South Koreans, do they want American forces to go home? They say, absolutely not. And we've reduced our footprint there. We have reduced our bases. We've returned over a great amount of the command to the South Koreans. And that can continue around the world, it should. But I think this is not a World War II or a Cold War base structure. It's a base structure based on having to get where you need to go quickly because the bad guys get to vote as to where they attack you. OK, I can assume that you probably do not agree on the outlook uh, the Koreans have with the United States uh, military personnel on ground. But can you, you cannot deny that they have voted that the United States bases should remain open when it has come up? Well, in, in any country where there are US bases, there is a diversity of opinion, of course. There's some who are very supportive of, of the US presence and, and some who are quite opposed. I think the South Korea example is, is an important one because that's a country where uh, there was a dictatorship that we supported to maintain our bases in South Korea. And sadly, the voting is, is, is the exception, uh, not the rule when it comes to countries that 
host our bases. In fact, there's a clear preference that the military has shown in having US bases in undemocratic countries, in countries led by undemocratic regimes, dictators. Um, throughout the Persian Gulf, we have, we have bases in every Persian Gulf country except Iran, all of which are undemocratic. Um, and there are cases elsewhere around the world. Um, and I think this is one of the most troubling aspects. Often the bases are uh, defended as, as, you know, these are spreading democracy around the world. And quite to the contrary, our bases time and again have supported undemocratic regimes and uh, put clamps on democratic movements within those countries. All right, let's take some questions from our viewers. And the first one is from Aaron McCormick. Isn't the problem with the overseas bases that the U.S. sees itself as the world's policeman, needing outposts around the world to keep the peace? I'll let you go first, Peter. It's a question I get very often, and I, I, I use this example. If you go buy a house, what's the first question the wife asks the real estate agent? There are two questions. What are the schools, okay. and is it safe? They don't say, you had too many policemen around here, right? I think I want to go to a neighborhood where there are no cops. If we want to go someplace in the world with our friends and allies, want to trade, do business, do investment, which is what we're about, you want the place to be safe. We don't do investment in North Korea. We don't do investment in Zimbabwe. We don't do investment in Haiti and other parts of the world because they're a mess and there isn't order. And there aren't rules that people have obeyed. That's when I think, I think people are going to have trouble with Iran, even with the sanctions going away. So we're not the world's policemen. Do you think we're, we see ourselves as the policemen of the world? I, I think that has been part of the problem. I think the, 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 the questioner is right that we need to rethink fundamentally our, our approach to the world. And, and I think what has been a great amount of hubris when it comes to how the United States engages with the world and, and thinks that it can tell the world all too often how to run it, uh, their affairs. Um, and I, I think, sadly, for me, the, our bases overseas in, in recent decades have, have made it all too easy to, to launch offensive interventionist wars in, in Iraq, twice in, in Afghanistan. Um, going back to the, the war in Vietnam would not have been possible were it not for for bases throughout East Asia. And I think we need to move away from military forms of engagement toward diplomatic forms of engagement. Um, I think there are alternatives that would allow us to deploy military force rapidly um, without maintaining large numbers of bases overseas. And uh, I, I think this is, there's no more important moment uh, than to rethink these fundamental choices that the United States has made as a country. Okay, let's take another Let question. Me just, I want to respond quickly. Afghanistan was not an offensive war. They attacked us. They were the ones that harbored the Taliban, I mean the Al-Qaeda that attacked us on 9-11. We had to go and take them down. The problem we've had is counterinsurgency once we've taken the bad guys down, which we've done brilliantly in a very short period of time. We didn't seek out Afghanistan. Okay. And we have a question from Brendan Harris. Why don't we sell arms to our friends and allies we do. And let them defend themselves. We'd make money, and we wouldn't need overseas bases. The Russians are the number one seller of weapons in the world. We're number two. And three is probably China, but they also use North Korea as a proxy. So you have to do the numbers, and then you look at the units. I look at the measurement of how many planes, how many things. And also, a lot of it's not published that the Russians do. Okay. I, I think the United States has, has beat out the Russians, but I'm, I'm sure they, they, they rival each other uh, for number one arms dealing in the world. Uh, but I, I think it, the question, again, is a, a very good one. Um, Germany, Japan, South Korea buy huge amounts of weaponry. Germany, Japan, South Korea, all in the top 10 in terms of military spending worldwide. And yet we have 174 bases in Germany, um, 83 in South Korea, 113 base sites in Japan. Uh, these are also you know, some of the wealthiest nations in the world. It's unclear to me how a base in Germany protects the United States how it protects Germans, for that matter, um, when they have such a capable military of their own. 
It protects the Baltics and protects Ukraine, without which Putin would be marching into, as he said the other day, I could be in the capital of five NATO countries in two days. When you look at the 83 bases in South Korea, I asked General Dunn, who was the top military advisor to our negotiators in, North, in South Korea, why the number of bases, and he says, you can't put airplanes that are fighter planes and airlifters and tankers all in the same base. You have to have diversified capability, and they have to mesh with each other, which means you have to have a lot of bases. It's not that you have 83 bases, all of which have the same capability as all the others. So it looks like a large number of bases, but some of them, as I pointed out, they're gas stations. Uh, they're Navy installations where in Pusan, the Navy can refuel, but they don't have Navy ships based there permanently. They don't have any weapon systems there, okay? so. Part of it is you have bases which integrate with the South Koreans where we can work with them on a monthly basis. We train with them. That's just the facts of life. The fact that's interesting is if you take the countries that David uh, mentioned, Germany, South Korea, Japan, and you could have taken England, that's 60% that's, uh, of all our bases worldwide are in democratic countries. Yeah, I, I think um, you know if if so many of our bases are gas stations, which and Peter's exactly right that, that providing fuel is an important part of our base network overseas. They're very expensive gas stations. Um, if we're spending you know 85 conservatively by my conservative estimate, 85 billion dollars a year uh, maintaining bases and troops overseas, this is a lot of money just to build some gas stations. And I think we really need to think about alternatives to our current strategy that would allow us to spend that money in, in ways that would meet needs here in the United States. So our infrastructure, military bases abroad is very robust. Meanwhile, our infrastructure here in the United States is, is crumbling in, in all too many cases. And I think we need to, to very quickly change our priorities when it comes to, to spending and uh, how we use our military forces. OK, that's all we have time for. Again, the book is Base Nation, How the U.S. Military Bases Abroad Harm America and the World by David Vine of American University. Thanks to Professor Vine for joining us to discuss the book and to Peter Husey of Geostrategic Analysis for his critique. And thank you for watching Bookmarks. I'm Mike Adikamli. We'll see you next time.